Today we are observing the auspicious appearance day of our beloved Param Guru, the spiritual master of our spiritual master, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. He is glorified with the prayer, Ati Martya Charitraya Svashritanan Chapalane. His life is extraordinary, supra mundane. And we hear about his life in this beautiful book called Acharya Keshari. His name means the lion like teacher, Keshari, like a lion. Acharya Singh Harupine, he is known to be like a lion. So there's a lot of beautiful symbology around this lion-like love of Param Gurudev. He was a great manager. I don't like management. So I greatly respect anyone who is showing those transcendental characteristics. He managed the 64 temples of his guru. 64. Not only helped manage, he was one of the main managers, but he helped develop from the very beginning. And he helped create the core of the Chaitanya Mat, which was the first temple of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. When Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada began his preaching pastimes. Before that, he had done nine years straight chanting the Maha Mantra for 15, 16 hours a day. Every day, three lakhs Harinam. And after finishing his chanting of Japa, he would chant Gayatri Mantras two, three hours a day. So 16, 17 hours of his day were spent in meditation on the names of God and praying to God. And he had taken a vow to chant 1 billion names, not throughout his whole life, but over a course of eight, nine years. He chanted 1 billion names of God because he had been given the mandate by his spiritual master and his father to help establish the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the world. But ultimately he is showing us in his life what is the prime necessity of life as a human being, which is to realize God, our relationship with God. And the means to do that is by chanting the names of God until one comes to that stage of realization. So he had chanted the names of God 1 billion times. And then Krishna as the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared to him along with his associates, Lord Nityananda and their associates along with his lineage of gurus. They all appeared in a vision to him and said, now you must inaugurate the preaching mission of Lord Chaitanya and spread it throughout the world. He said, I am alone, how will I do it? And he said, we will send our associates, don't worry. So he began preaching in a very humble way. He was given responsibility to take care of the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya on land that was recovered by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, given to him by the British rulers at the time, Lord Chaitanya's birthplace, and he was serving that place, that area. It's a very important thing for us that the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya is being served by the line of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhaktisiddhanta Prabhupada, but yet he had no assistance in his mission. He was very small, very humble, very poor. And first, one, two people came at first. Parameshwari, one great devotee, Nara Hari Seva Vigraha Prabhu, who was known as the mother of the whole mission. He cared for everyone, more than any mother, like a million mothers. For each and every person who came to that mission, he looked after them with more love than millions of mothers, feeling like their life was more valuable than his own. And Vinod Bihari Brahmachari, who is our Param Guru. His name was Vinod Bihari as a young man. Later, as a sannyasi acharya, he was given the name Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami Maharaj. 
Bhakti Pragyan means the wisdom of pure devotion. Bhakti Pragyan and Keshav means the lion like teacher. So that was his name as a sannyasi acharya. But as a young man, his name was Vinod Vihari. And his aunt once brought him to meet his guru. This is before he had received initiation. He was a young man in school, college, and his aunt, Sarojavasini Devi, was the first lady disciple of Bhaktisiddhanta, the great guru, Bhaktisiddhanta Prabhupada, who had chanted these one billion names of God. Before he had chanted the one million billion names of God, he was known as the greatest scholar of his time. Even as a young man, he had a perfect memory. Anything he read once, he would never forget. But memory is one thing. Intelligence is also actually a little different than memory. So it's one thing to be able to remember things, another to create things that others should remember, right? There's a difference. You can remember something you read or you can create something that other people try to read and remember. So he was such a scholar that he was of that unique genius. His every word was like scripture. He was such a scholar. In the high university, the best university in India at the time, they gave him a seat, a tenured seat that he would never lose it to be a professor in the university, even though he didn't want to do it. He was such a great astronomer, that they wanted to give him that seat. But he said, I have not come to this world to count the grains of sand on the land or the stars in the sky. I've come to realize God and help other people realize their relation with God. So he began his mission and this Vinod Bihari came to him as a young boy with his aunt. And at that time, Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada said, I will establish temples in all the islands of Navadweep and I will establish centers throughout India and will preach throughout the world the message of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya's desire is that. Lord Chaitanya directly appeared to Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada and requested him to do this. So he said, I will preach and establish temples throughout Navadweep and his lady disciples, Rojavasini Devi, humbly and yet smiling, asked her guru, who will do this? That is so much responsibility. It's something to give a teaching. It's an entirely different thing to establish many centers and to maintain them all. What to speak of financially, but all the people that come, maintaining all their mental burdens, right? Imagine thousands and thousands of people and all their problems, and you have to maintain it all. Excuse me, to get his face there. Look at that shot. <laughs> Arivo, imagine how powerful you must be to maintain that all. How much grace of God must be with you because that's not possible by any material intelligence or power. So, Bhaktisthanda Prabhupada said, this Vinod will do it all. He said like that, Vinod will manage everything. At that time he was a young man 15, 16, 17. And the aunt thought, wow. So shortly after that, he took initiation and joined the mission completely and began serving. And he maintained everything. From the very beginning, he helped develop the mission, maintain the mission at every level. And then some other devotees came and the mission began to develop. Krishna sent his own associates, his own dear beloved devotees to help establish the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the world. One time as a young boy, he was out late and his mother thought, you know, young boys coming home late, who knows what they're doing? And she was waiting outside. She was very strict, very powerful lady, this Param Gurudev Vinod's mother. And he came home one night, 10, 30, 11 PM. And she was waiting at the door, she was very angry. Where were you? What were you doing so late? He was very humble. He didn't want to retort in an aggressive way. Or even, you know, when someone's questioning you like that, it's not like, hey, I was doing this. No, he was very humble. He said, please, I'm sorry, I'm late. He said, what were you doing? 
very humbly he said, I was caring for an old lady with cholera. He said, oh, really? How did that happen? He said, every day you give us money for lunch at the school. And me and a group of friends, we save every last cent we can. We eat very simply, the simplest thing. And we collect and pool all our money and we use it to serve those who are in the most need. Those who are very sick, widows, orphans, elderly, sadhus who are not being looked after. And so today there was a lady who was very sick with dysentery and cholera and we arranged her to be taken to a very good hospital. We paid for everything. She was clean, she was given medicine and we stayed with her for four or five hours to make sure she would be okay. And then we took, came home so that they sent us away from the hospital. We'll go check on her tomorrow. Please mother, we are very sorry for being late. She, as she heard him speaking about this, she was weeping. Said, oh, such a son, you know, such a son that he's willing to give up all his own comfort, all his own pocket money for service of others. We heard this verse, Jivana nirvahe ane udvega nadibe, bara upakara nija sukha pasharibe. How should we live our life? What is the essence of Sanatan Dharma? There are many verses in scripture that talks about Sanatan Dharma, but there are a few aphorisms which sum up the essential mood. Seva Parama Dharma, service is the highest religion. Ahingsa Parama Dharma, non-violence is the highest religion. And Krishna Prem, divine love of God is the highest religion. The essence is love, the essence is service, and the essence is Rather than harming others, you should try to help others. If you love God and you want to serve God, then how can you harm others who are part and parcel of God? Rather, do you honor them and serve them? So the essence of Sanatana Dharma is to live life, not for your own happiness, but for the service of others. It's a very high ideal, very high ideal. But this is the life of our great teachers and they show that in their life. It's a very noble pursuit, right? That I am born on this earth to serve. That is my calling. <laughs> we all have different ways of expressing service, but to understand that my purpose in life is, is to serve God and to serve others. That is why I was born. Not out of self-sacrifice, not out of some kind of glorified masochism, no, it's my nature to serve. I want to serve. It's my purpose. I was born to serve. But what am I serving? I'm serving God. And in that pursuit of service, I will serve his children. I will serve his earth. And I will develop in my relationship with him. That Mood of service is applied into terms of nationalism and environmentalism and so many causes, but those are temporary, but it's our tendency that is revealed to serve. We're serving our children, our parents, we're serving in our business, we're serving our customers, we're bound to serve. So what is the difference between someone who is a workaholic serving all the time, working all the time, and someone who is a saint? There's a huge gulf of difference. One is working day and night as karma, just fruit of work, action and reaction for self gain. And a saintly person is not acting under illusion in fruit of activities, thinking I am the great doer, but they are understanding that I am simply a soul whose nature is to love and to serve God and to serve his people in this world. And I am, my purpose in life is not my self gratification, not to be happy myself. My purpose as a living being is to serve and to please God and to act under his will and his desire. So Vinod Bihari Brahmachari was like that from childhood. As a young boy, he took a vow that in my whole life I will remain celibate. And he formed a club of other students. 
young boys. Our whole life, we'll be celibate monks. Why? So that we can dedicate ourselves without any distraction for the so service of the whole of society, the whole of mankind. There's nothing wrong with family life, but it's naturally limiting to a great degree. We are focused on serving this unit, and that is very exalted if we are doing it righteously, serving our family. That's a very exalted position. But such a saint like this is dedicating every ounce of his energy and life in the service of the whole, who is God and all his constituent parts. So that is our Vinod Bihari. As a boy, he showed this characteristic. Ati Martya Charitraya Swashritanchapalane. Jiva Dukha Sadartaya Srinama Prema Dhaine. I'm going to go ahead now to a hint of his internal identity on page 197 of his biography. Our Gurudev wrote this book. He said it was the best book he ever published. Yes, because it's about his own guru. So our gurus, they have such glorious character, such glorious activities. But this is the height of their glories. We should also come to understand the depth of their glories. And that is not seen by material vision, what they have done in this world. It is a spiritual internal reality. So there's a story about that. He was once building a temple in Navadweep called Devananda Gaudiamat. And when it came time to build the altar, they were going to paint the different steps. Gurudev was there and one other, Muni Maharaj, was there. At that time, he was, Muni Maharaj was a congregation member who often would help donate for development or would give loans. Param Gurudev, he was so charitable that he would take out loans to pay tickets for pilgrims to come to his Navadweep to go to all the sacred sites because he would travel throughout Bengal and people were very poor. So he would take out large loans and he would give everyone money for tickets and then he would host them and feed them for weeks. And then over a whole month, he would travel and whatever collections would come, he would pay back his loans to this businessman, Sanatan Prabhu, who became Muni Maharaj. So he was a very dear associate. So one day they were looking at developing the altar. And Param Gurudev said, there will be three steps below the altar. The first step, which is the highest step, will be blue. The second step will be yellow and the bottom step will be Arun Varna, the reddish pink color seen at dawn, this saffron color. Muni Maharaj then asked, why should it be like this? And Gurudev replied, the highest step will symbolize the sapphire-like luster of Sri Krishna. The second step will represent the golden radiance of Sri Radha, Krishna's dear, most beloved. Then he was silent. After a few moments, with a very grave countenance, he continued. The third step will be the color of a Saki, Manjari, who brings all kinds of delight, Vinod, to the divine youthful couple. Her cloth and is depicted by this Arun Varna, saffron color. As he was speaking, his voice choked. His voice faltered, his throat choked, and he became motionless. So he became stunned in ecstasy of divine love. And seeing his extraordinary mood, we were both struck with wonder. So this is Gurudev seeing this and Muni Maharaj. At that time, we could not understand anything, nor did we have the courage to ask him. <laughs> after he entered his unmanifest pastimes, after he left this world, 
we realize the meaning of that hint. The lowest step symbolizes Sri Vinod Manjuri, Sri Yugal Kishore. So this is his internal form as Radharani's maidservant, Vinod Manjuri. And he is the divine couple's eternally playful maidservant. Gurudev had given a hint of his own spiritual form in a hidden way. It was around that same time that I inquired from him in private. Did your Gurudev reveal the identity of the Siddha Deha, the spiritual form, to any of his disciples? Very solemnly, Srila Gurudev said, yes, he has certainly done so. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Prabhupada has given the identity of the Siddha Deha, or eternal spiritual form, and instructions in the method of bhajan to some of his very qualified disciples. Because without this, the Rupanuga line would come to an end. He also gave this method or pranali to myself. So Bhaktisiddhanta Prabhupada gave that realized form. It was, it's generally considered to be realized through sadhana, through our own practice. When we practice very seriously, over the course of many years, some indication of that will come. And if we continue developing that understanding, that realization, then it will fully blossom into this time where it will become so prominent that that life is more real than this life. Then this life, we have so much energy and strength to serve because we recognize our life, its purpose as service, and we're relishing the sweet love of Krishna in our hearts in our realized form. So this body is then just like the puppet of the soul instead of the puppet of Maya. What is a body? A body is a puppet. And it's acting under either the spiritual willpower or material will, material energy. But when we come to a high stage of spiritual life, the soul becomes very powerful and full of ecstasy. What is the most powerful force? Love. By the power of love, almost anything can be accomplished, especially transcendental love, that transcendental power. Yes? By the power of that transcendental love, almost anything can be achieved. So therefore, he's very powerful. One time, the samadhi of Gorkishwar Das Babaji Maharaj was being swept away. You can sit to the side, focus in class. Okay? Let me go. <clears throat> so Gorkishadas Babaji Maharaj Samadhi was being swept away <clears throat> by the tides of the Ganga. Mm -hmm. And he went and with a few monks, he protected his Guru Maharaj's Samadhi, that means when he, his place where he was put to rest as Samadhi, it was being swept away by the river. And he went with 10, 15 other monks, and in the middle of a flood, he transported it to Navadvip Dham, and many people complained and tried to send him to prison for moving this grave, and they took him to court. In his life, there's 30, 40 court cases that he oversaw. Mm -hmm. And he always achieved victory in every single one, except for one time when he achieved victory indirectly. There's a story about that also. He achieved indirect victory. They told him that you cannot move someone else's remains. It's illegal. But he, he spoke in the court that we are not Christians and this is the burial site of one of our saints. So it was going to be swept away in the flood. And according to our tradition, there are rules about how that can be done. And we did it according to those rules. And he was very intelligent. He gave many very powerful arguments. And in that way, he, he was victorious. But that's just one example. There are dozens and dozens of examples of his heroic services and so therefore he was always glorified as very powerful 
associate of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. One time, some of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada's scholarly disciples were criticizing him to Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. They said, Oh, Vinod is just a manager. And sometimes he's not wearing tilak, sometimes he's not even wearing a dhoti. There's a famous painting of him wearing a beautiful suit, and he's welcoming the British governor of Bengal into the temple in Navadweep, Mahabharu's birthplace, and he's wearing a beautiful black suit as a brahmachari. And people said sometimes he's wearing a suit, sometimes he's not wearing tilak, he rides, he had two horses, and he would go everywhere by horse. And they said sometimes he goes for business because they live in Mayapur, and then Navadweep is the main town, so he would craft across the Ganga regularly. At that time, Mayapur was like a jungle, and the main town was in Navadweep. So he would cross by boat and he would pay for the whole boat. You know, and if you go to these boats in the Ganga, sometimes there's a hundred people on one boat. But he was so timely in his services that he didn't have time to wait for half an hour sometimes for the boat to fill up, 20 minutes for the boat to fill up. So he would spend the money for a hundred people himself just to go and do his work. And people would complain, he's wasting so much money. And Bhakshanta Prabhupada was always disturbed if anybody complained about him. One time someone wrote for, and saying, I don't think he is a Vaishnava. And Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada said, anyone who is saying like this, they are not a Vaishnava and they are not my disciple even. So you don't understand my relation with him. He is the only disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada that Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada would refer to in a very informal form of address, Dui, which means very intimate. It's word only used for your children, for your partner, or someone who's your very dear most friend. And Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada would call everyone else up. With great respect, he would address everyone. So one time, he was criticized like this. Everyone was criticizing him. Oh, he's just a manager. He has no time to study. One time, one of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada's other scholarly disciples saw him reading a book, a very high class intellectual philosophical book and he said what do you know of this you're always managing and so he closed the book and he said you can ask me any question from the book and so the person opened the book and said okay page let's see what you know okay page 255 paragraph 3 what's it talking about and he quoted it and they said okay what's the meaning and he explained the philosophy very complex difficult philosophy and he explained and he said okay speak about the book he spoke about the whole book from memory but what is that memory he didn't have time to read, didn't have time to study. Sometimes he would read a little bit and study, but he didn't have so much time. But actually he knew everything. So actually Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada would have an annual assembly and he would have everybody come together and he would award different, you know, respectful tokens of his appreciation. And he asked Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami, at that time Vinod, to come forward and he gave him all of his Vedanta scriptures, all of his different books. He said, this, all my library is yours. Why? Because you are most qualified. You know the scripture, the true essence, and you can speak it and reveal that true essence. Later on, the dear most, you could say, he was one of the dear most disciples, but some of the most scholarly disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada they would send their disciples to him to learn Vedanta. And when he established his mission, he called it Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti. And he was the one who gave the Bhaktivedanta titles. He gave the Bhaktivedanta title as a sannyas name to Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. He had received that Bhaktivedanta title, but Param Gurudev gave it as a sannyas title. And then in that line, he also gave our Srila Gurudev, Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, that title, then Bhaktivedanta Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, Bhaktivedanta Vama Goswami Maharaj. So Param Gurudev began that Bhaktivedanta Sannyas line. He said, real Bhaktivedanta means those who have relationship and realization of Krishna. Bhaktivedanta, the highest knowledge, Vedanta means the end of all knowledge. The end of all knowledge is, what is your relationship with God? And that is bhakti, devotion. That is the end of all knowledge. So therefore, one time he was having a court case. <laughs> this is what happens, you know, if you're preaching. He said, if you're preaching successfully, then there will be problems. And what does it mean when there's a problem? Does it mean you give up? 
When there's a problem in life, what's the proper reaction? What should we do if there are problems? Yes, we should fight. This is what Krishna teaches Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. When there are problems, we should face them. And so he was like that always. So one time he was in this court case and the judge lamented that, oh, alas, I'm always spending my time simply in court cases and I don't have time to worship the Lord. And Padam Gurudev responded, for me, I think court cases are bhakti. Why? In Vrindavan, immediately he showed where he was thinking. The, the judge said, how is that possible? And he said, in Vrindavan, Radha Krishna, whenever they have any argument, any dispute, sometimes Lalita will advocate against Krishna. She will prosecute Krishna and Krishna will have to come to Radharani's court. And they will give so many reasons why Krishna should be chastised. And they will say, okay, for so long Krishna will have to write a treaty. He will have to write that I am the servant of Srimati Radhika. And also he will have to admit all his different misdoings, all his wrongdoings. I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. And I am the servant of Srimati Radhika eternally. Right? So Param Guru, they've said court cases are bhakti. Why in the spiritual world they're also playing like this? And he told different stories. One time Radharani was given a royal Abhishek and crowned as the Empress of Vrindavan. And Krishna asked for some service in her kingdom and she gave him the service. I don't know what she was thinking. She gave him the service of being police. <laughs> right? Very dangerous service to give Krishna. <laughs> right? But Krishna in that service he started taking bribes, rasgulas, gulab jamins, sweet rice, ladus, pakoras. And so in due course, he was caught red-handed, always taking bribes. More sweets, more butter, right? Fresh butter, saffron, shrikan. So they would have to do court cases against Krishna. And he was punished. And he was put in Radharani's flower kunj, flower grove, and he was bound there, unable to escape. So Param Gurudev understands these pastimes and he's very uh, connected to Srimati Radhika. Here's the picture of him, you can see. There's Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada and Param Gurudev in this beautiful black suit. See? Beautiful black suit. All right. Any special stories someone would like to hear about? Let's look in the index. There's so many beautiful stories of his life. Without these great personalities in our life, we have no, no pure direction, what to do, where to go. There's a nice garden story, yes. One time when he had established his mission, there's many stories, so we're not getting it into every detail, but some of his god brothers came and asked him why he didn't have a garden in his temple. He had, a, he had some land, but he was very busy in outreach and travels and in, in service, and he didn't have a garden. And he said, oh, I'll show you my garden tonight. They say, why can't you show me your garden, garden now in the daytime? He said, no, I'll show you tonight, this evening. Come this evening. And so they came in the evening, and there was a grand assembly. And he said, I want you to come see the most fragrant flowers in my garden. And then he invited Srila Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, Srila Vama Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhaktivedanta Trivikram Goswami Maharaj. He said, please, you can speak. And they each spoke so beautifully, so eloquently, the whole audience was in tears. And then he told his god brothers that the flowers in an ordinary garland, they will last for some days. But these flowers of my disciples, their fragrance will spread throughout the whole world and by their teachings so many other gardens of bhakti will develop in the world. So he said that is my garden. So that is also similar to our focus here in this ashram. Our focus in this ashram is developing the mood of bhakti, pure devotion in the following in the moods of Krishna's associates in Vrindavan. That is the priority. There are so many external activities we can perform, but the most important activity is what? How to develop the mood of pure bhakti 
and how to have that realization in our heart because that fragrance of your relationship with God is so powerful that its fragrance will spread throughout the whole world. And then many people will many fl- can make many flower gardens, and they will. But without love and devotion, what is the use? Love and devotion, that is paramount. All right. Any other story? Any other stories, Tirtha? Vrindavan? What story would you like to hear? There's many beautiful stories. Mangala, any stories? Hmm? Okay, there's a beautiful story. We have a few more minutes, then we'll do a kirtan, okay? One time, there was an attack against his guru. They wanted to kill his guru because he was such a powerful teacher. And he was opening up the mercy. He made things more broad and open. Before, unless you were a Brahmin by birth, you could not take Diksha Mantras, Gayatri Mantras, and there were many restrictions. But Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada said, the soul is by nature divine. Every soul has the right to come into a relationship with God through the practice of Bhakti Yoga. Not only those born as Brahmanas, not only men and not women, everyone, every human being, And every soul, in fact, is by nature a part and parcel of the Lord. So birth Brahman, while it is a very high position, it is not the ultimate consideration. So for many reasons, they were opposed to him like that. That was the main one. And a few others, they did not like anyone being a guru who was not born as a Brahmin and so on and so forth. So they tried to kill him. They ambushed him. He had a parikrama, a pilgrimage party, with 10,000, 15,000 people. And they were going through a narrow area where it was congested in, in Navadweep, West Bengal. And, and they were going through this gully corridor. And then from every side and from high up, they had gangs of you know, mercenaries and all the different groups of people who were opposed, throwing bricks, throwing stones, throwing glass bottles at the party of the pilgrims. And they were specifically targeting the guru. They wanted to kill him. And immediately, everyone started, it became chaos. Everyone started running here and there and screaming and crying out. And most everyone just scattered. But Vinod Bihari, Brahmachari, immediately lo- thought, where is my Gurudev? And he immediately went to protect him. And he used his own body against any of these, you know, rocks and stones and bricks and glass bottles. And he immediately took his Guru and quickly ducked into a house of someone who was favorable. He knew someone right there. This was in the area of Proto Maya, and he knew everybody in the area. So he immediately took Bhaktisanta Prabhupada there, and after protecting him, inside the house, he immediately asked his guru, please. He was wearing white cloth as a monk, but white cloth, junior. And his guru is a sannyasi. And he asked his guru to wear his white cloth and to give him his sannyas cloth. You can imagine, this is not a very ordinary thing to ask but he was doing it only out of the mood of protecting his beloved Gurudev. And so his Gurudev smiled, and that time it said that's when he gave him sannyas. Right? What is real sannyas? He took his Guru's sannyas cloth, which is a special sannyas cloth, and he gave his white cloth to his Guru, and then that family escorted Bhaktisanta Prabhupada back to his home, back to the temple when it was safe, and Padam Gurudev went back out into the crowd. But it said that at that moment he took sannyas. What is sannyas? That we are ready to give up everything for the service of Sri Guru. That is sannyas. We are ready to give up everything for the service of Sri Krishna. Mana sadeha geho jo kichu mor ar piya tua pade nanda kishor. You have a question? I have a story here about the eagle dropping money story. Nice story. Eagle dropping money story. One time, there's two eagle stories in relation to Bhakti Priga and Keshav Goswami Mars. One time when he was just a little baby, his mother in Bengal, they would put the babies out in the sun and rub them with mustard oil. It makes them very strong. And one day as he was a little baby outside, two, three years old, a great eagle came and picked him up and began to fly away. 
And immediately the mother was just inside. You know, it happened in an instant. And she saw him flying away and she started screaming and crying out with great anxiety and great anguish. Imagine, this little baby is being carried. And she called pandas and priests and they all began to chant prayers to protect him. And then that eagle was seen to fly far away. And then over a lake he came down and placed the boy on where they would collect bamboo and other items in the lake, right? And he placed him right in the center of the lake, very gently, and flew off. And the mother swam into the middle of the lake and brought her boy back as if the life had returned. There's a beautiful esoteric story behind this, but anyhow, this is one of his childhood pastimes. So later on, one time they had a temple. He has established many temples, but they were very poor in those days. And so they were fasting. They had nothing in the temple store, and they had no money to buy anything. They were very poor. So they were all fasting that day. And it was a Kaddishi day, the day that we fast anyway. It's not a full fast always, but we don't take grains and things like that on the Kaddishi, the 11th day of every lunar cycle, lunar fortnight. Every fortnight, the 11th day, we fast on the Kaddishi. So Padma Guru, they said, okay, today we will all fast. And they were very happy. But then all of a sudden, just after that, some of his god brothers arrived. Some of his god brothers arrived there and immediately he was shy. Oh, my god brothers have come. I must cook something for them. I cannot make them fast. But I, he didn't have anything, so he thought, okay, maybe we'll go and beg or do something. And just at that moment, they arrived. He was meeting with them. He told his disciples, anyhow, try to figure out some way to feed them. What should we do? And a little bird came carrying something in his claws and he dropped it on the ground. And they opened it up, and it was coins. A little bird flew in and dropped a packet of coins, and they opened it up. Oh, and it was enough to make a huge feast. So he said, immediately take this to the market. This is being sent by Srimati Radhika to serve our spiritual family. So they went to the market, and they prepared a huge feast and fed them very nicely. And then just after that, a telegram or a letter came from one of his god brothers, and he gave, was it 100 rupees at the time? He gave a large sum, enough to maintain the temple for a few months. And he said, just see, Krishna promises in the Gita, yoga kshema vaham yaham. Krishna says, for those who are surrendered to me, I always protect them. I provide whatever they need, and I protect whatever they have. Tesham satita yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam. Those who have love for me, I bring them to me. I give them the intelligence to come to me. And ananya shintayantumam yejana paripashite tesham nityaryukta tesham that yoga kshema vaham yaham. I give them whatever they need. So therefore there's a verse about faith. This is very important for us to know. What is the meaning of faith for us in our line? Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kohe Sudrida Nishchoi Krishna Bhakti Koile Sarva Karma Krita Hoi. That faith means the firm conviction that simply by devotion to God all work will be accomplished. Means God is the ultimate provider, God is the ultimate maintainer, God is the ultimate protector. We are servants of God. We will do our service. But we ultimately understand that we are not the doers. Everything is being maintained by Krishna. You just see? And there's many stories like that in his life. So that's a very beautiful example. I recommend everybody to dive into the nectar of this book. It's a very beautiful book. All the different philosophies of our line are present there. Many of his songs are present there. Stories of his character, how he protected the Sampradaya, the lineage are there. It's very, very beautiful. Let's see if we can pick out one or two more. Any more favorites anyone wants to hear about? Let's hear about how he served in the publication department. All right. He arranged a press and they brought it to Mayapur. Prabhupada began to publish Sajan Toshini, a weekly magazine. And he had a daily newspaper. 
a daily newspaper they would print, putting each letter in the printer, and then all the different monks would go out on the buses and in the subways to distribute them every day. By God's arrangement, we are out here, so we are not able to go on the bus and subway every day, but eventually it is our aspiration to have a place where we can do that service, and some of the monks can be engaged in that. But you imagine every day they had a department just to publish a daily newspaper, a weekly magazine, a monthly magazine, and then they did it in English, they did it in Odia, they did it in Bengali, they did it in Hindi. This is in the 1930s. And by this powerful preaching, very soon they were developing a movement. So they had their own printing press. Bottom, Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada called his intimate associate Vinod Bihari to come to Sridham Mayapur and he appointed him manager of the Chaitanya Mat, his, his tem- main temple, where Mahaprabhu's birthplace is. He was the manager there. From that time, Sri Vinod Bihari took care of the temple's various services, especially concentrating on managing the property. And he began to develop the mission in all respects because of his very skillful administrative skills. So he served in this publication department. He's, he maintained the mission. There's so many beautiful glories of his. It's all I can recommend is that to gradually develop some relationship with these personalities. You don't have to read the whole book, but every year we'll develop more and more relationship with them by hearing their glories. So this is our main activity. We want to hear the glories of those great personalities who not only were such great souls in this life, showing us their ideal character and behavior and ideal service, but they are also Radharani and Krishna's eternal associates. So hearing about their life is supremely purifying. All right, let's open a few pages and see what he wants to teach us. There's so many beautiful things here. These books are a treasure, actually, because it's the heart of our Gurudev is present there and his beloved, his Guru, and all their conceptions. And so really it's, if you take shelter of these books, then naturally the mercy of our Guru Varga comes to us. I'll tell one more story, okay? He had one assistant, one sevak, his name was Ananga Mohan Brahmachari. And he served him with great sincerity and dedication as a young boy. And at that time, Param Gurudev, Bhakti Prigan, Keshav Goswami Maharaj, in his later years, he became very internally absorbed. As we heard about last night, some of the teachers, they develop complete internal absorption. They forget the external body. He started changing his clothes only after some days. And he didn't like to bathe every day. He thought it was, a, you know, like a waste of time. <laughs> not that, it's not to imitate now. <laughs> But he was so internally absorbed, realizing his form and serving there, Sri Krishna, that the external body was, for him was an afterthought. He would say, you know, saffron cloth is always clean. And he would say, you know, every Purnima, sometimes they would bring him, you know, they, he would bathe, but he would take one bucket and just simply bathe and move on and continue his service. And he would, he stopped eating grains. He ate very simply. So serving him, this brahmachari was always serving and only following uh, his character. So, you know, his Gurudev would eat simply, he would eat simply, and he lived a very austere life. You can't imitate these great personalities, right? These great personalities are operating on a different level of power and connection. And so he was trying to follow, but he became sick. And actually he developed tuberculosis. At that time in India, it was impossible to cure. It was like a death sentence. This is in, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s, that time. So, Padam Gurudev started spending a lot of money to try to fix this, help heal this brahmachari. And many of his godbrothers were complaining, oh, you're spending the temple money, because he was still serving many of his godbrothers in that mission, you know, and people were complaining about it. But he didn't care. He said, what is the use of this if we're not able to take care of Krishna's devotees? What is the purpose of our money if we can't take care of Krishna's devotees? You understand? What is the purpose of it all? Maintaining buildings is not as important as taking care of devotees. This was his mood. So he sent him to a special area of India which is very good for healing. Siliguri. Not Siliguri. This is 
in between Bengal and Bihar, there's a very healthy area in the foothills, and it's a very healthy climate, very medicinal, and he was given all kinds of remedies, but it still wasn't working. And he asked someone to take care of him, and our Gurudev volunteered. But it was seen like, okay, every day he's going to be cleaning him, taking care of him, and tuberculosis is such a thing that if you have any blood or anything, then it's extremely contagious. And if you catch it, then you can also die. And that's the most likely outcome. So everyone was a little afraid. Oh, he's going to die anyway. You let anybody take care of him. You know, they can put on a whole suit and do it. But Gurudev immediately wanted to take care of him. He thought that the best service I can do is service of the servants of our Guru. That is the highest service. Serving the sevaks. Serving the servants. This is our Muda's devotees. We want to serve the servants. Especially those who are very dear to Guru. So he began to serve him. And Pada Gurudev was very pleased. But he was serving him for months. Serving him for months. Later on, he would say, everything I got in my life is by the mercy of my Guru when I took care of this Brahmachari. All of the mercy I got in my life is because I put my life in my own hand. He would say like this, you should take your life in your hand for the service of Guru. That is the spiritual family we are trying to form. Gurudev would say, what is lacking in this world is pure love. And he said this was the love that was present in the ancient times, the, lo the love of Bharat for his brother Ram. He was ready to sacrifice everything for his brother Ram, the love of Lakshman for Ram. This love, that is the real power of a mission, of a society, of the world. That is the most powerful thing. So we should have that mood of love between devotees where we're ready to give our life for each other. We're totally ready to care for each other and all needs because that is the mood of Vrindavan. We spoke about this yesterday. If we don't have love for people who are our God brothers and God sisters, how can we say we have love for Krishna? How can we think that Radharani will bestow her service and Krishna will bestow his service in the spiritual world if we cannot show that love in this world to those who are family members of our Guru, who are dedicating their lives to developing in bhakti and service, then we should show that. We should exhibit that, and that is showing Krishna that we are sincere in our desires. Otherwise, we want to be with Krishna for our own selfish desires. As soon as it comes time to show our dedication, yesterday Radharani, we read how Radharani said, I am ready to give up my life millions of times for Krishna's happiness. And she's offering Arati to Krishna with that mood. I wish to offer my body, my mind, my soul to you a million times over. And so Gurudev had that mood for Anangamohan Brahmachari. He was giving up his life for him. He is a sevak of my Gurudev. He is dear to my Gurudev. And Gurudev also got sick taking care of him. And that Brahmachari got sicker and sicker. And before he left his body, when he was laying on his deathbed, his face was glowing, effulgent. He smiled. He began to weep, tears of ecstasy. And he said, Oh, my Gurudev, Oh, Radharani is calling me to the spiritual world. Krishna is calling me to the spiritual world. Ha Gurudev, Ha Radhe, Ha Krishna. And he saw like a window to the spiritual world opened. And Radharani's hand and Krishna's hand and his Gurudev's hand were extended to him to bring him to that spiritual world, this boy. And Gurudev was sitting by his bed and he prayed to him, Oh, please, dear Anang Mohan, Please also pray for me. Please, may I one day have your relationship with Gurudev. May I have this level of love for Gurudev. May I also come to Vrindavan. Please pray for me. And in that way, this boy left this world. So Gurudev said, you know, in spiritual life, we all practice spiritual life with different degrees of faith and different degrees of sincerity and different degrees of dedication, different degrees of devotion. But when you meet these personalities who completely surrender their mind, their body, their very heart and soul, their speech, all their energies and service, and in their relationship with Guru and Krishna, then these personalities instill faith by their mere presence. Right? That is what is a Guru Sevak. Someone who is actually in their heart, so dedicated, so fixed in their conviction, in their love, that what is that mood? Krishna bhakti koile sarva karma krita hoy. If I completely dedicate myself to Krishna in service to Guru and Vaishnavas, then all necessities are accomplished. Sarva karma krita hoy. All duties are fulfilled. 
Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kore Sudra that is joy. Faith in God means the firm conviction that by my devotion to the Lord, everything is fulfilled. My life is fulfilled. Therefore, we say for such people, Devarshi Bhutapti Ninam Pitrinam Nakinkaro Rini Charajan Sarvatmanasya Sharanyam Sharanyam Grito Mukunda Parihritya Kartyam. For those who completely dedicate themselves to the service of God, all their debts are immediately nullified. They're immediately freed from all debts, from all obligations to the forefathers, to this world, to the government, to the demigods, and they're liberated. And once they achieve liberation, Jivan Mukta Suchate, Param Guru Dev wrote in one article that the Guru Sevak is liberated in this body. That is the example of Ananga Mohan. He was liberated even in this body because of his complete dedication to his Guru Seva. Therefore, it's said that simply by Guru Seva, one can cross over the most difficult obstacles, the highest mountains, the most perilous challenges can be easily crossed over by someone who is sincere in their dedication and service to Sri Guru. Therefore, we sing, Mukam koroti vachalam bangum langayate girim yet kripa tamahang bande Sri Guru dina taranam paramanandam adavam that it is by the mercy of Guru that a lame man becomes very skilled, very talented, very agile, very capable, able to climb over mountains. A cripple can climb over a mountain and a dumb man can speak eloquently simply by the grace of Sri Guru and by the mood of devotion and dedication. So Param Guru, they said the Guru Sevak is Jivan Mukta, liberated even in this body. They become Jivan Mukta. So therefore we pray May that devotion and loyalty to Sri Guru appear in our heart. Param Gurudev's life was the perfect example of that mood of dedication and loyalty, Guru Nishta. And therefore, Gurudev said again and again, Guru Nishta is the backbone of Bhakti. Without Guru Nishta, we cannot advance so much in spiritual life. We think, oh, by studying I can advance. But that's not in scripture. The, the books say that simply by study you cannot advance. So if you study the books, you'll come to a statement that says, by studying me, you cannot advance so much. <laughs> right? Oh, go and find a spiritual master, surrender and serve. That's what it teaches you. That's what Krishna says in the Gita. Go and take shelter, inquire, serve, surrender, and advance in spiritual life. That is what Krishna teaches. That is what the scripture teaches. That is the meaning of the scripture. All the scriptures are the relationship between a student and disciple and the teachings they give and the services that they render. That is the relationship. So therefore it says, Yasya deve para bhakti ryata deve tathaguro tasyaite katita hyarta prakashante mahatmana. All the revealed scriptures manifest themselves directly to that sincere soul who has equal devotion to Krishna as he does for Sri Guru. Equal devotion to Guru as he does for Sri Krishna. Yasya deve para bhakti ryata deve tathaguro tasyaite katita hyarta prakashante mahatmana. So Param Gurudev was a perfect example of this. He was so dear to his Gurudev and he offered his life. Many times in this book, Gurudev said, for this glorious achievement, his name will be written in golden letters in the histories of India. Why? Because of his devotion, because of his dedication, because of his love. Right? This is how I want to conclude, is how I want to begin. It's those who have the most love are those who completely offer themselves in loving service. It's not that service comes first, love comes first. Otherwise, service becomes material activity. If there is love, real attachment, real sweetness, Guru Dev said, if you are zero, you cannot do anything. So much better than being zero is being lusty, being greedy, being disturbed, because you can transform that into love, into a positive thing. If you are just zero, you are like dead, inert, jad. So Gurudev would say it's better that you have attachment and then you can channel that attachment to Krishna and to Guru and Vaishnavas. It's better that you have lust than you have nothing. Lust is desire. It's better that you have desire than no desire at all. Otherwise, how are you going to desire for the highest thing? So whatever love you have, whatever lust you have, whatever anger you have, whatever desire you have in your life, you offer that to the Supreme, to God, to Krishna, and then you're able to channel that through our lineage of spiritual masters, then everything becomes transcendental it becomes 
spiritualized because that energy is God's energy. Whatever desire you have, whatever lust you have, whatever anything, that property you have, when you offer it, that's why Sharanagati is the first and end. The beginning and end of bhakti is surrender. Because when you offer it completely, manasa, my mind, deha, my body, geha, my home, my possessions, arpiya tuapare, I offer everything to you, O Krishna. Then Krishna says that I am yours, you are mine, and therefore, Mahapri said, Guru Sevak Manya Apanar. The most glorious position is as servant of the devotees, servant of Sri Guru. That is the highest spiritual position. In this world, the highest position, we think, I will be king, I will be emperor. That is the highest position in this world. The highest position in the spiritual world, the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. That is the highest position in the spiritual world because that is the position where you receive the condensed nectar of love of all of the associates of Krishna. If we are only the servant of Krishna, then we get Krishna's sweetness. But if we are the servant of the servant, that means we are the servant of Sri Radha. She is the chief of all the beloveds, of all those who please God. She is the chief. So we are the servant of the servant. That means we are not Krishna's servant. We are Srimati Radhika's servant. Understand the difference? Servant of the servant. That's one. Then her sweetness, Krishna's sweetness, both. But therefore, we do not say we are the servant of the servant. We are the servant of the servant of the servant. That means we are not Krishna's servant and we are not directly Shmati Radhika's servant. We are the servant of the servant of the servant. That means Sri Rupa Manjari, she is Radhika's chief maid servant and we are praying every day, Sri Rupa Manjari Pada Se Mora Sampada. The lotus feet of Sri Rupa Manjari are my life and soul. Why? Because then we get to relish her love, Radharani's love, Krishna's love. So therefore we do not say we are Rupa Manjari's servant. We say, we are the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. Because then Rupa Manjari's love is coming to Rati Manjari. Rati Manjari's love is coming to Vinod Manjari. Vinod Manjari's love is coming to our Gurudev Manjari, to Param Gurudev Manjari, all the way down to us. And therefore Mahaprabhu says, Gopi Bhartu Pada Kamalayor Dasa Dasa Anudasa. I am the servant of the servant of the servant. What does that mean? The servant receives all the mercy. The servant receives all the love, all the nectar, all the sweetness, right? Where does the most sweetness come? Whoever is the junior, like, if, you know, you have grandparents and then the baby. The babies get spoiled, right? Babies get spoiled the most. So servant of Krishna doesn't get spoiled. Servant of servant of Krishna gets somewhat spoiled. Servant of the servant of servant of Krishna gets the most spoiled. Even more though, the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant they get all the juice, all the nectar, all the rasa, all the sweetness. So we are simply praying to have that eternal position. Therefore, Mahaprabhu says, Tad britya, britya, paricharaka, britya, 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 mang smara loka nath. I pray to be the servant of 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 the servant. Seven times servant. Why? Every layer of service, you're multiplying the sweetness. You're multiplying the joy. You're multiplying the love. Because that world is based on love and service. And that love and that service is the epitome of ananda bliss. Premananda is sevananda. Sevananda is premananda. Service is ecstasy. And love is ecstasy. So that's why we think, oh, back in the days in the temple, they would fight over the broom. Hey! My service. I want to sweep the floor. <laughs> you know, this is the mood of. Why? Because it's very sweet. What, who, someone you love, you wish to serve. It's natural. It's the, it is Sanatan Dharma. Guru Dev said the universal religion is Seva and is love. Prem, love, and Seva service. That is the universal religion. That is eternal throughout all time. The names of religions will change. But the eternal principles of religion never change, and that is love and service. We can give different names, different sectarian cultural artifacts and symbols, but love and service is eternal. So our Padam Gurudev had so much love for Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada, his Gurudev, that he epitomized that love in every action, which is all in the mood of 
how can I please my Gurudev? How can I serve my Gurudev that he may not have any tension, any stress, and everything I will take on my shoulders? Man nimitam. For his sake, I am ready to do anything. This is the mood. Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada therefore established this mission all throughout the world. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, our beloved Gurudev. And this current of this conception is still going on. They are still present. Being the disciple of the disciple of Param Gurudev, he is more affectionate. And being the disciple of the disciple of the disciple of Param Gurudev, you get even more mercy. Grandfather gives mercy, but great grandfather gives even more mercy. So with every generation, more mercy is received. So we're praying for his relationship, we're praying for his loving service. And in this way, we offer a few words at his lotus feet. Hare Krishna. Vanchakalpa Drivyascha Kripa Sindhu Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namon Maha Gorkramanandi Hari Hari Bho. So we'll sing one song to Param Gurudev and then we'll finish the night. Hare Krishna. <coughs> Param Gurudev wrote a very beautiful song and we'll read that song. It's called Radha Vinod Bihari Tat Vastakam. He actually wrote the Mangalarti song we pray with. Every Mangalarti we sing, that is his song. And every time we do Tulsi Parikrama in the evening, that is his song. And he wrote this song about the reality of Radha and Krishna. Page 272. Hmm. Maybe we do this translation tomorrow. It's a very long song. We can go in circles and read it really quick. What do you think? It's a very long song. Actually, the commentary is long. The translation is not so long. I worship the lotus feet of that form of Krishna who, being absorbed in anxious thought of Shimati Radhika, has assumed her golden complexion. Radha Lingita Vigraha means Radharani has embraced Krishna and now Krishna has thus become golden. When the supreme object of loving service and the supreme loving servant merge in absolute love, how can any distinction be made between them? But when they are separated, all of their distinctions are continuously amplified. Very deep. So maybe we'll read that tomorrow because there's a deep philosophy behind every verse. So the third verse. The divine couple who are eternally engaged in transcendental pastimes comprise an existential reality that is inconceivably differentiated and non-differentiated, for the supreme potency and the supreme possessor of potency are always one with each other. One should know that the absolute truth, which is one without a second, has divided his pastimes into two parts. Gorda is Krishna and Krishna is Gorda. Hence, both of them are factually the original form of Godhead. Whenever all colors exist simultaneously, a golden hue is manifest. However, in the absence of all color, a black hue is manifest. So this is referring to Radha and Krishna. The supreme absolute truth, which is one without a second, is both full of all qualities that are transcendental and devoid of all material qualities. All transcendental qualities are eternally manifest in Sri Gora, and the totality of transcendental moods or humors, completely devoid of any mundane qualities, is manifest in Sri Krishna. Those who give up this twofold form of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Absolute, and worship the undifferentiated, all pervading, impersonal existence, are intelligently look are so called intelligent, but really they are looking for rice in empty husk. By the mercy of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada, I worship Sri Vinod Bihari, who is a name for Krishna, and Sri Mati Radhika as they meet with one another. Whoever recites this astakam, eight verses of this prayer, with great faith will fully comprehend the reality of Sri Krishna and become immersed in meditation on the lotus feet of Sri Gorda Sundara. Jai Sri Param Gurudeva Ki.